Before I start sermonizing, that second lesson, if you didn't catch what we just confessed, which we confess every week comes straight out of Scripture, hopefully you were having a deja vu moment right there, because that's exactly where it comes from. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Carla, a breast cancer patient, was in the doctor's office. The doctor was discussing reconstruction, the options that were available to her, and how she could redefine her body with reconstruction as if nothing had ever happened to her in the first place. Carla had a friend who had done exactly that, reconstruction, tattoos. It had been very helpful to her self-esteem. It worked for her. But Carla felt differently about the situation, and she explained to the doctor why. Hey, Doc, I've gotten accustomed to my scars. Some might see them as ugly. For me, they are constant reminders that I'm here for a reason. I could have died. I didn't. I survived. For Carla, there was a sense of peace. That regardless of her physical condition and the changes that had happened to her, the enemy had been defeated, death had been avoided, and the walking wounded was still, in fact, walking for a reason. There was purpose in her scars. Carla had made peace with her body and had also made peace with her circumstances. Three times today in the gospel, Jesus says, peace. He says the exact same thing three different times. Peace to you. The disciples were hiding out. They were concerned for their own well-being. Of course they were. They killed Jesus. They might come after them next. <clears throat> they had trusted Jesus as most humans in their incapacities could. I mean, they got as far as they could. They had seen him in ministry. They had followed him. On Good Friday, they lost trust in what they had done for three years of their lives in following him. Trust and hope dashed on a cross. They began to doubt who Jesus was as Jesus was crucified. Their belief, their hope, certainly any trust had an issue. When Jesus was nailed there. What happens now? Folks knew they followed Jesus, so probably somebody would come for them, so they hid and they waited for this whole thing to blow over, hunkered down behind a locked door, self protecting. They believed in him and he was dead. Fear of the unknown mixed with their grief and their sorrow. No leader there to help them during this time when they needed him. So Jesus came and he stood in the middle of them and said, Peace to you. Having said this, he shown, showed them his hands and his side. <clears throat> what a moment that had to be. Can you imagine? There was Jesus again, alive with evidence of his torture. Not a magic trick. Not hiding scars from them. He showed them his very purposeful scars. Any sense of abandonment or disbelief disappeared. Everything that Jesus had told them was coming true. They were seeing it in their time, in real time. Their fear, their doubt, their broken trusts were healed when they saw those scars. They were in God's presence. God had never left them. And here was the proof. Yes, peace to them. So immediately after comforting the disciples, Jesus issued a command. Isn't that how it goes? He gifted them with the Holy Spirit. He breathed on them. That pneuma, spirit, life, breath. 
Jesus had died and he was breathing into them. And the command was, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. He breathed into them the Holy Spirit. That word breathe, it's ruah in Hebrew, it's pneuma in Greek. It's the same meaning that is used in Genesis when God breathed new life into the dust that became Adam. God giving new life through his breath sharing of the Holy Spirit. The disciples were witnesses to what can happen to those who spread God's word. They saw it in real time in their lifetime as crucifixion. Sometimes, I think we glaze over when Jesus was telling them that he had gone. Where the, wherever he had gone, they would follow him. We view that as go into the world. And that's true. That's the instruction. Jesus also knew the hardships that they would face as they declared their faith. And maybe not all crucifixions happen on a cross. They would need the Holy Spirit to attempt to follow Jesus' commands. And he knew that. They would need the Holy Spirit's action to forgive sin. They would need it to build communities of believers to be the church that Jesus calls us to be. Jesus had made his disciples special agents, the nucleus of his church. They were empowered by the Holy Spirit to declare the good news of forgiveness through a risen Lord, and no one would believe it unless they'd had a seed planted of faith, unless they were convincing enough to tell the story of Jesus and his love. Yes. Purposeful peace to them, not the fluffy stuff. And then there's Thomas. I feel so bad for Thomas. Does anybody else feel bad for Thomas? His reputation over the years has been scarred as well. Who among us would have reacted any differently than him? I watched him die. Until I see those scars again, I don't believe what you're saying. I'll believe it when I see it. We all share in Thomas's type of cynicism. We all struggle with faith and belief. We all fall short of purposeful peace, the stuff that only the Holy Spirit gives, with our don't just tell me, show me situations and our human tendencies to want to control things that are beyond us. Even then, Jesus says, Peace to you. Peace to you. He instructed Thomas to feel his wounds and see his scars. And Thomas replaced his skepticism and cynicism with my Lord and my God and never poked into him. Thomas made his confession without even actually touching Jesus. Because Jesus' purposeful peace had evidence that he could see. Yes, yes, purposeful peace to him. These moments from thousands of years ago are moments for all time. And at that time, Jesus' disciples were fearful. They were shaking in their boots. They were hiding themselves and they doubted. But don't we also act as if God is not with us when life shakes us upside down? I do. Shouldn't. Human. It cracks me up and upsets me when I hear folks speak about the Holy Spirit showing up as if we control anything that the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit never left. Jesus gave it a long time ago. The advocate. We need to remind ourselves to show up. We leave. We insist on holding God to our standards and understanding when God does not have any such limitations at all. When we shout, Christ is risen. Hey, Christ is risen. We state our faith beyond our limitations. It's a faith statement with an exclamation point. We affirm God is active in this world today. He never left us. Peace to us. Purposeful peace to us. When we were baptized, 
the Holy Spirit breathed new life into us. Because of the Spirit, our sin, our shortcomings that stand in the way of eternal life were washed away, purposeful peace to us. We bring our worldly cynicism with us when we enter into this sacred space a lot, just like Thomas. We doubt, we fear, we hide, we believe it when we see it. And yet every time we share in the Lord's Supper as a community of faith, we touch his hands and put our fingers in his side, Thomas's. The enemy has been defeated and death has lost its sting and the walking wounded are still walking with our scars. Our Savior, by what he instituted, still yet walks here with us. There is purpose in his scars. Peace to us purposeful peace to us. So in a few minutes, we will share the peace of Christ with one another. And for some, it's time to remind others of a current event or where to go to lunch. But at that time, that time in the service is purposeful peace time. It is meant to be a reminder of Christ's purposeful peace among us and for our neighbors it allows us time to make amends with our neighbors or at least make an appointment. I need to talk to you. Before sharing in Christ's body and blood, sharing the peace of Christ has a purpose. Early Christians, as recorded in our Acts text, did you notice it used to be Old Testament lesson, Psalm, New Testament lesson, and now it's lesson. They're pulling things for us to read that we might not ordinarily have done prior and it's a good thing. It's the lesson because it's from New Testament. The first lesson in Acts was, we are of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of these things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. I see a whole bunch of different people out here. I see people that have had outs with each other before and might still do. And yet you all have something in common that's bigger than that. That Christ gave the apostles great power through testimony. They are living out what Christ has given to them, and we are to do so as well. Because of that, the hypocrisy rate was down. It's not that those early Christians were perfect people. Far from it. Not even close. But because their vision of who Christ was and what happened to him and how he rose was their primary focus for being together, when folks heard that testimony, it rang true in their ears because of how the Christians behaved. Not as individuals, but as a unit. Scripture tells us there was not a needy person among them. Wow! I'm sure some of them were hungry. I'm sure some of them didn't have a roof over their head. But there was not a needy here person among them. And then it lists how they helped one another so that those who didn't have got. This is fulfillment of the golden rule of loving God more than anything else and loving neighbor as ourselves. The common denominator in putting God first and loving others is reducing the need in ourselves to promote ourselves first. Right? Joy. Jesus, others, then yourself. Joy. That's where it comes from. There was not a needy person among them. So much more can be accomplished for the sake of the gospel and for everybody around us in church, outside of church, all over God's creation when we learn that lesson about peace in you. Less ego stroking means more seeing, more hearing, more addressing real ministry. What we were created and designed to do while we wait for the Lord's return. And when we are fully aware of the depth of his sacrifice and the miracle of his resurrection and how that determines our own eternity, there's no room for our scars to keep us from progress as followers of Jesus. They are what they are, but they don't get that much power. Our scars simply become the overcoming that Jesus has given to us. Those scars are beautiful. Those scars are miraculous. They are meaningful. 
those scars serve a purpose. And that's yet another way God gives us to be more Christ-like because we, through Jesus Christ, have received healing through those scars and through his scars, eternal life to come. Carla, cancer patient, said a mouthful that day in her doctor's office, didn't she? Hey, doc, I've grown accustomed to my scars. Some might say that they're ugly. For me, they are constant reminders that I'm here for a reason. I could have died. I didn't. I survived. So Jesus did and lives forever. So we also do. And because of his grace and mercy, we live forever. That is purposeful peace. Peace be to you. Amen.